three, two, one, and they're off. Ten laps on the streets of Charleston, West Virginia. Here they come. All right, welcome to Pro Nats 2024. You're probably wondering, how many road races have you done? And the answer is, this is the first one of 2024. So I'm just as excited as you are to see how it goes. I've been pretty much training for these gravel races, primarily with a focus on Unbound being in two weeks from now. And so um, doing this race might not be the exact good, perfect prep for Unbound, but I was thinking, well, I could go three and a half hours to do pro road dance or drive like all the way to freaking Texas, which I, I don't know, 15 hours or something. So I opted to drive over to Charleston, West Virginia, where pro road Nats were hosted this year. You'll follow, you'll see me following Cade Bickmore, former teammates uh, on Texas Roadhouse. Both of us are no longer on Roadhouse. He's on Echelon. I'm doing my own gravel privateer thing, but I know that he's a good wheel to follow. We both started near the back, so I'm just going to stick on his wheel up this first climb. Um, already seeing some dropped chains, some carnage. Obviously, got to make sure that front derailleur is dialed for stuff like this because you're constantly going back and forth. So you can see me and Kate are not blasting up this hill, but we are making progress, right? You can see that we are consistently passing people all the way to the top, but we're also not blowing our wad on lap one because this is a long race and it's going to be a hot day. So um, just wanting to get closer to the front to stay out of trouble. These downhills on this course were amazing, so much fun. Um, like just the right amount of turns and straightaways and there were a couple really beautiful spots like right up here where we're gonna pop out and it's like you're riding along a mountainside. It's like guardrail there, drop off there, rocks on the left, like pretty wicked awesome stuff if you ask me. I thoroughly enjoyed this race course in Charleston. I thought it was way better than the previous courses that they had in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, just because it was a little bit more fun. It was a little bit more scenic. There were two hard climbs, both right about two miles each. The first one that we already did was the harder of the two. With two climbs each lap, this was going to definitely be a race of attrition, meaning there was going to be 140 starters, and at the end of the day, only 23 finishers. That's insane. The really tough part on this is like, I kind of feel like we all just went way too hard. You know, obviously the world tour guys can handle this high pace even on the flats in between the climbs, but guys like me, basically like non world tour riders, uh, I was expecting us to go hard on the climbs and chill in between the climbs and it was full tilt. Like this is single file all the way to this first climb. Sorry, second climb. And here we are dropping into the bottom of the second climb and it's pretty gradual, but you're gonna see about to happen. You can hear the volume, I'll let you listen. About to hear a flat tire. Keep your ears peered, peeled. That was Ty Magner on the Legion team. Got put right into that little crack. Ooh, and probably sliced his sidewall just enough to instant flat. You can see the sealant and everything come out. Now it's lap one and I am a little bit worried about my positioning, so I'm thinking, all right, I wanna get closer to the front. I was afraid that it was going to, the pace was gonna pick up so quickly that uh, very suddenly that the field might be splitting. And so I wanted to move up and then this happens. Hmm, yep. On the deck, lap one, not what you want. I do wanna point out the door was there. I was following Lawson Craddock and right there, it looks like a clear shot, right? And within one second, that opening it has closed. The rider on my right had, had shifted over just a little bit. Both of us bumped and both of us crashed. It's not his fault, it's not my fault. Obviously, I thought that there was a fine opening right there. Lawson Craddock had just gone through there um, and he just kind of moved over. So he's probably blaming it on me, I'm probably blaming it on him. I think it's one of those situations where that's what happens. It's bike racing. You can't control what other people do. I didn't think he was going to move. He didn't think that I was there. We bumped. We fell. It is what it is. Um, I don't think that rider was able to get back on his bike and keep going. I think he had a mechanical issue. So I do feel really bad about that. I hate that that happened, but that's bike racing. And uh, 
Yep, it is what it is. In, 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 in hindsight, I wish that maybe I was a little bit more calm, a little bit more laid back because the field is obviously going pretty chill on this climb, the second climb of the race. I was able to chase back up and catch before the top of the climb. Um, so here I am just kind of catching on to the back of the group. I'm already kind of moving my way back into the field. You can see Brandon McNulty right there to my right. So um, I was probably a little too anxious at the beginning of this race and trying to be too aggressive. Um, not that I was attacking or anything like that, but I should have been maybe sag climbing these climbs a little more. But in my mind, I was thinking I need to stay at the front because there's going to be big, massive field splits, and I don't want to get I don't want to be caught on the on the back half of a field split. And so I was trying to stay towards the front. This is the second climb. See us, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like we're going hard, but I'm gonna do a lap analysis of all the climbs and how hard they were and normalized power and heart rate, but my heart rate was consistently in near, right, right around 190 beats per minute on these climbs, um, even just sitting in the group like this. So definitely hard racing. Pretty neat experience at Pro Road Nats. You know, I'm right on Lawson Craddock's wheel. A couple years ago, Lawson and the Tour de France crashed, I think on stage one and cracked his uh, scapula. And I remember they calling him, they called him uh, Awesome Craddock for the entire Tour de France because he finished the entire tour. And here I am riding behind him, getting to race against him, which is pretty cool. Uh, and a Volo guy is attacking on the right side of the road. We were going really easy right before then. And then that a Volo rider attacks. I think there's maybe a group of five up the road already. A Volo attacks, they pin, they pick up the pace. I can see Nielsen Palace right there. He's going hard. So right here, the, the, the climb kicks up steep. It's like you go from big ring to little ring. And I'm on Sam Boardman's wheel. I think he's trying to conserve energy knowing how long the race is. Smart guy. But I'm thinking this is it. This is the breakaway. This is the field split. I need to be here. If you pay attention, you can see that pink jersey up ahead. Nielsen Palace is drilling it on the front. And I'm kind of caught right here where I can make a choice to move forward with these group of seven or eight riders ahead of me or drop back to the main group that's chasing behind me. And I was kind of in no man's land. So I decide to go super hard and bridge up to this group. I'm in this group. I think there's about eight of us when we pop out at the top of the climb. And it was not an easy effort. In hindsight, I think that this was the nail in the coffin for me. And this is only the fourth climb of the race, 10 laps. So there's total, there would have been 20 climbs and I'm only on the fourth climb of the day. And I'm already burning matches that I probably didn't have to burn to try to make the lead group like, yeah. So looking at the power, it's two minutes, a half a mile, normalized power, 530, max heart rate, 203. The 203 beats per minute is what I really want to point out because I don't think I ever quite recovered from this effort. I got really overheated from this effort. It was really hot. Um, should have had a little bit more just like cold fluids on my bike, like just straight up cold water that I could douse myself with. Um, and then it was kind of a wasted effort because then the group behind us, it all ended up coming back together. And you can see uh, there's a Legion rider that pops by because he's caught up to us. And here in a second, you'll see Brandon McNulty and he's there with us and he slides up right past me. And right after that, you've got Alexi Vermeulen coming right back up. So there, there were too many fast guys back in the main group for this breakaway of a couple strong guys and Nielsen Paulus to get away. Nobody's going to let one world tour rider like all those other world tour riders don't want the one world tour rider to get off the front so should have seen that should have been a little bit more hesitant should have been thinking about okay this is a long race i need to oh former former teammate eli house wanted to say hi to the youtube folks so there he is go follow him eli house um so yeah i should have been playing it a little bit more conservatively um I'm behind the future winner of the race, Sean Quinn here. You've got two EF riders, one's Nielsen, one's Sean Quinn. They will end up in the breakaway of three with Brandon McNulty and my boy Scott McGill, who's going to be up there for most of the day with them as well. And that's going to be the top four of the race, all kind of right there. Um, so we are on lap three. I'm already out of water. I started with one bottle, pretty risky, I'll have to admit, 
but I was thinking if I could start with one bottle and have less weight on these really hard climbs, knowing that it is a race of attrition and I want to conserve as much energy as possible, I opted for the more risky choice of starting with one bottle, which may not have been a good call. So I need to get a feed on this lap and I'm not 100% sure where my feed zone peeps are. I know they're on the climb somewhere up here, so I'm looking for them right here. And you'll see me slide over to the right side of the road to get my feed up here in a minute because I see my guy. Yep, right here. I'm like, okay, I need a feed. Thank you, Brian Furley. I grab a bottle. Uh, I was actually being fed by Fur Brian Furley, and he was feeding me and Lawson Craddock. And, uh, and I actually grabbed one of Lawson Craddock's bottles. And I don't know what that mix was, but it was not the mix that I normally use. So um, that is not ideal, you know, tr drinking something that you have no idea what it is. Uh, ideally, I would have had my bottle with flow formulas in it. Um, but hey, he had, my, he had a bottle, it had fluids in it, and I'm going to drink it regardless of what it is. Coming around for lap four. Again, there's my buddy, Lawson Craddock. Awesome Craddock. Should we call him that? Yeah, we should call him that because that's a wicked awesome nickname. I wish people called me Awesome Craddock. That's a cool name. Trek Little Rider. That's pretty cool. It's just cool to be in like a group where there's like World Tour riders next to you. Uh, I don't know. I know. I know they're just humans like we are, but... It is kind of cool. I, I'm going to fanboy a bit, but yeah, I see these jerseys on TV all the time and to be next to them in a race is, is pretty cool. I'll give you that. All right, so let's do some lap analysis because I'm pretty close to the end of my race. If you haven't known, I only finished half the race, so I wanted to point this out. I did five laps. Here's, here's what it looks like. Climb one and climb two for each lap. You can see my normalized power on the first lap was below 400 for both, but my heart rate already getting up to 188, 189. Lap two, lower power on the second climb, but that's mainly because um, it was really, really easy at the bottom. But you'll notice lap two, climb two is where the 406 normalized power was, and that was where I had to do that big 530 watt two minute power was. And you notice that is the that is the climb that has the lowest heart rate. And you're like, that doesn't make much sense. And it's because my heart rate was down in the 160s at the base of the climb. And it was up um, in the 200s at the very, very top of the climb. And so the average was only 178. And in hindsight, I should have not bridged up to that breakaway. Should have sat back and my heart rate would have been even lower for that climb. Normalized power would have been lower yeah, so then you can already see the effect of that on lap three, climb one, where my normalized again was 409, and that's a sustained effort of about seven and a half minutes. The climb one took about seven, seven and a half minutes. Climb two was taking about, I think, six minutes. So it's a little bit, climb two was a little bit shorter. So you're looking at 409, 193 beats per minute. Um, and I think that that was an effect of me going so hard on the climb prior to that, that like I just didn't recover and my heart rate is still super high from that effort. And then after that, it's 186, 191, 189, 190, 180. And obviously on that last climb, lap five, lap climb two, I had pulled the plug um, because you could just see the normalized power just drop tremendously. From lap three, climb one to climb two, I went from a 409 to a 325 normalized power and then didn't go over 350 for any of the other climbs. And I was, and it's worth mentioning as well that I was in a, in a group. I was in a, in, I, I think what was left of the main Peloton and the, a couple of the world tour riders like Paulus and McNulty, those guys were already kind of off the front doing their own thing. And I was in a group with some strong guys. Tyler Star Tyler Stites is in this group. Brendan Wirtz is in this group. Some really strong guys. And I'm still only doing 325, 330, 299, 348. So the, you could already see the normalized power dropping tremendously just from the first two laps to laps three, four, and five. And I, that's why I say I think that we all just made the mistake of going out way too hard um, in this race. So I'm going to get... Uh, this is, again, back to lap four. I'm going to try to get some uh, ice and some water.
you can sell you can see that I'm gapped off the back here but I'm able to power down and catch back up to the group um, I was able to pass a couple of those caravan cars and catch back up to the main group um, of what was left of the main group and then here's the final climb cars again coming around me caravans passing me you can see that group that I was in just slowly rolling away and when I got dropped we were only doing like 300 watts but I couldn't even do 300 watts like I'd already blown myself so much that 300 watts was unsustainable this is Tyler Stites he's gotten second and third place at Pro Road Nats the last two years and he is struggling so this I just wanted to point this out not to point him out but just to point how hard this race really was and here's the last shot that I got and I am just crawling back to the finish line so in hindsight really hard race I only raced for about two and a half hours, half the race, and here's what, I got 39th place. There were about 140 starters, so even after only doing half the race, half the race, I still finished in the top 30% of this race, about. That's crazy. That's so crazy. I think between the, the heat and it being a new course, it, it just took its toll on riders. So next up, I've got the Snake Alley weekend of racing this weekend up in Iowa, and then the weekend after that is Unbound. And then I'm taking a few weeks off doing a mid-season break, much-needed season break. And that's it. If you want to support me, check out all the links in the description. Buy a state bike, order some flow. Do all the things that you want to do to support me. Share this video. Subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.